exactly 11 minutes after. I'm one minute late starting. I'm sure I'll be able to make up the 60 seconds now. Have I? Was everybody here last time? Who was not here last time? You were. And my name is Douglas. Your name oh. Is Christy. Are you are you an operator? Yes. And who hi, Christy. It? Supervisor Todd for the Senior Outreach Program. Did you say the Senior up. One? Senior. We have a Senior Outreach call. Todd, um, I, call. I, I senior see Outreach. Just... Yeah, Senior Outreach. Am I a senior? I have to check that out. Let me see. I'm 82. I must be. I'd say. <laughs> I don't know if I'm 69. Else... I guess I qualify as a senior. Oh yeah. I don't think I don't, I don't think of myself as a senior. I'm trying to close this up. Is right. anyone else out there uh, attending for the first? When is? When is? Okay. Okay. So, in the in the first part of this, we, we covered essentially an overview about suicide, the fact that it's a public health crisis, the fact that you know every 12 minutes someone dies by suicide in the United States, and I think every 40 seconds. World, it's a huge problem. We haven't had enough resources and enough uh, attention put to it. It's just very, it's it's kind of, it happens behind the scenes, you know. Well, I think they said a, a, a grandmother and her two children, die, or grandchildren, died in this California fire. Yeah, the car fire. I keep seeing it over and over again. I mean, it's a shame that that's three people, right? Yeah. And, you know, meanwhile, since that's come up, there's been about, you know, um, what's 120 times 10, like 1,200 people died by suicide. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, the headlines are captured by the things that are, you know, sort of more sensational. But in the meantime, you know, unbeknownst to anybody, this thing is happening, you know, on a regular basis. And um, so we just need to get, bring more awareness to it. So in, in the, so this, this has been divided in three parts. The first part is called Suicide of Public Health Crisis. We covered last time. The second part is called Inside the Suicidal Mind, which we're in the middle of, and the, and the third part is going to be called Helping the Suicidal Caller. So, in this particular part too, what I'm trying to do is is give you an idea of what it's like to be suicidal from the inside out. And I draw upon three sources. The first is I've read a bunch of memoirs. The second, I've been running support groups for 17 years, and I've had clients who've been suicidal, made attempts. And most importantly. My own suicidal episodes, which have been coming and going since I've been uh, 25 years old. I'm 69, so what is that? 44 years. Uh, it's a long time. I, not consistently, thank God. <laughs> but whenever I go into a really bad episode, I, I've never been in a really bad episode of depression without having suicidal ideation or, or a real obsession about it, because that's what happens to your brain. So, so, um, so this this slide is called the instinct to survive, and um, of course. The reason that only a, I, I don't know what the stat, we can look it up later, but for every, I think, 25 people who are suicidal, I think only one makes an attempt. Or there's some something of that nature, a small minority, because the instinct to survive, right? Uh, Voltaire called this the most powerful instinct of nature. Mm. And so you can think of a dialectic. You have the suicidal mind that wants to get out of pain and wants to escape the hell, and the other side is, is the will to live. And I, I have this force is your ally that bumpy build a bumpy that never gives up. So, oh, should be gives up. My brother looked at this this morning. You made all these grammatical mistakes. What's going to happen? I said it's okay. I'll correct them when I get home, and then they'll they'll be for posterity, right? So, <laughs> but anyway, the bumpy that never gives up. Okay, so I was I don't know maybe a month ago, maybe after the first uh, right before I give the first talk. Um, there was this bumblebee that was uh, on uh, the ground that in front of my house, and I could tell it was injured. And, you know, couldn't fly, so it was going to die, right? But it was trying to ride itself up and walk and fall down. It tried to ride itself up, walk and fall down. It was, it just, it just would not, what, what did Dylan Thomas say? Don't go, you know, peacefully into that good night rage against the dying of light. Remember that? Oh, that, yeah. that, 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 that bumblebee would not go peacefully into that good night. He was determined, even though he was a goner. The, the, the instinct to survive was so powerful that he was doing everything he could to ride himself and to try to fly. So I thought about that. I said, yeah, I mean, we all have that. It's programmed into us by nature, by natural selection, because you know that the species must go on. That's nice. You know, the show must go on. The species mm -hmm. must go on. Right? So, so, and the species are made up of individuals like us. So, um, so there's this tremendous survival instinct that is your ally working with people who are, you know, uh, are desperate. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, 
1978 study, 515 people attempted suicide on the Golden Bridge, but were stopped, found that 90% did not die from suicide later. So I guess they must have interviewed these people, you know. Oh. I, I didn't say how many years later, right? Yeah. But uh, so, so there was this whole thing. What we'll see this, if we have time, we'll see this video. I have two videos to show you. They're only five minutes each. But this whole myth that said, well, it, 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 you, if you prevent the person from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, they'll just find another way to do it, right? That's this, one of the myths, right? And because they didn't want to, you know, sully the beauty of the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So, and, but it's not true. It's not true because oftentimes these things are impulsive decisions. And uh, once the person is stopped, maybe what happens is that person went home and they got a call from their, you know, a good friend who came over and gave them some hope or, you know, parent called them or, you know, old boyfriend or girlfriend or something happened. They said, you know what, I, I think I can make it. But for that 10 minutes where they were going to jump, they were in despair but because they were stopped. Uh, they didn't get the opportunity and then the survival instinct took over. So the guy um, that was at the Gobi conference and over in Bend, he, he, what, uh, he, he jumped and he said the very Kevin first thing. Hines. Oh, Kevin he, Hines? Yeah, yeah, Kevin said the very first thing when right. he, he said, oh, sh darn, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't want to do that. I'm, I'm, we're yeah. going to see a video of him. He's oh, right. world famous, but I'm going yeah. to hopefully interview him for this book I'm writing All right. and you know, have him put an endorsement on the front page. If you don't get this book, I'll kill you. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Dark humor, any time to kick me. <laughs> Just kick me any time. Anyway, so, but, uh, but so, so um, Kevin Himes and a lot of other people came to prominence. I want you guys to read this article. All you have to go is New Yorker. I'll just go Jumpers, New Yorker, Tad, T-A-D, friend. I'll send uh, Sharon a link. So, so um, Tad Friend is a staff reporter for the New Yorker, I think the best periodical out there. In 2003, he did, a, he did a, a, an article called Jumpers about the, the attraction of the Golden State Bridge for people to, you know, to die by suicide. And, and the article is all about why this was preventable and why San Francisco was, you know, not doing what it could. Anyway, so there were two people he interviewed. One was Kevin Heise, and the other guy said, and I never forgot this word for word, and I was able to dig up the article from the archives, and I remembered it exactly. He said, the moment my hands left the railing, I realized that everything in my life that I thought wasn't fixable what was, in fact, fixable. So everything in my life that I thought was unfixable, <laughs> in fact, was fixable. And mm -hmm. he had that realization as soon as he got it. Same idea with Kevin Heinz, mm -hmm. but in kind of a slightly different way. And then, of course, he, uh, he survived. When I was writing my in my book, Healing from Depression, which is, uh, well, here, this is my memoir, going through Ellen's stuff. So I, I have a, a, an article, a, a, um, I have a chapter here called Madness or Suicide, It's Yours to Decide. So I, I talk about my own struggle with my suicidal ideation, all the different ways I thought, you know, I, I would kill myself. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, my next plan was to jump off a building, but after picturing myself walking to the ledge and looking down, I remembered that I was afraid of heights. <laughs> oh, well, so much for that idea. <laughs> so that was my little joke. It's true, though. And then a friend of mine at day treatment asked me an unsettling question. What if halfway down, what if halfway to the ground you change your mind? So this, is, this was written way back in 1996, and, you know, the Tad Friends article didn't come out until 2003. So... You know, these guys were not the only people to think about this. What if halfway down the ground you change your mind? Which is one of the things that, you know, if the fear of heights didn't prevent me from doing that, would have done it. So it's absolutely true. I guarantee you, I don't know if I can guarantee you, I'm sure, 95% sure that most of the people who jump off of bridges, once they jump, regret it. But, of course, at that point, they can't do anything about it. So, All right. Um, let's go to the next slide. So... Ambivalence refers to the indecisiveness that accompanies suicidal behavior at times. In the final months before the attempt, the person is unsure of his decision. Ambivalence is a good thing when your callers are ambivalent and they are uncertain about suicide and more willing to discuss other options and alternatives. So you said, you told me of a friend you had a suicidal episode, right? Mm -hmm. So you had ambivalence, right? Yes. On the one hand, on the other hand, right? And mm -hmm. the other hand went out, obviously. <laughs> but... So even when people are that much in pain and that much wanting out of this hell, that this never-ending hell, even then, 
they're ambivalent because of this survival instinct I talked about. Has anyone ever here been uh, had a suicidal period where they had that same, you know, the pros and cons? So, so ambivalence is good. Uh, and I think it's because of, uh, again, this part of ourselves that doesn't want to die, we just want to stop the pain. So to be honest with you, when I first did this uh, slideshow, I have a man in my men's group who's a professional. He does internet, he does website development, he does all this internet stuff for people. He's very, he's young, of course, very savvy. And he said, Doug, you need to put some pictures in your slideshow presentation. People don't just want to see words. So he gave me this uh, website called unsplash.com. Here are all these free photos. So he picked out a bunch of photos for me. So here's obviously somebody um, being ambivalent. And I just realized I hated Shakespeare. They made me read it in high school, but I did like Hamlet. <laughs> what did he say to be not to be that as a question, whether it's we should bear the slings and arrows of an outrageous fortune or, you know, or, uh, you know, or go ahead to death. But he said something like, you know, because we don't know what death is on the other side, that you know that kind of stops us from. We'd rather have you know the pain we know than the pain we don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's a beautiful soliloquy. I'm yeah. sure that he must have been suicidal. Does anybody remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, he was a troubled, melancholic Dane. He suffered from depression, like all the Danes do. I have, a, I, have a, uh, I do long distance coaching. I have a really cool guy in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. You know, you know. Now, one of my friends who's a addictions counselor went to Denmark. He said, "Oh my God." The parents are so happy. They get their kids get free uh, health care. They get free college tuition. Don't have to worry about them. It's a paradise. I want to move there. And so he, he quit his job. Wow. <laughs> Up he went. But then, like three years later, I've got this guy I'm talking with over the phone, and he said he moved to Denmark from uh, some sunny place uh, in South Southeast Asia. And he said, oh, he says, the people here are so depressed because the winters, the nights are so dark, and it never gets any sunlight. And there's a lot of alcoholism and you know, a lot of suicide mm. in Denmark. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so Hannah was melancholy. He came from Denmark. Maybe it was a long winters. But, <laughs> but anyway, there's ambivalence right there. Okay. By the way, if you have any questions or comments, please interrupt me. Yeah. As Did you guys hear that? If you have questions, you yeah, can speak up. Yeah. Anybody from the peanut gallery, please talk. <laughs> I am. Sorry. I am. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the mm. next slide is when you talk to survivors, they're glad they lived. There, here's the quote I was referring to. As soon as I went over the railing, I knew that everything I thought was unfixable was in fact fixable. That's a direct quote. Cool. Powerful. From, from, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, the man who survived the jump off Niagara Falls says he was given an Italy sunlight. That's just an interview. Now, why don't you so click that, on that link at the bottom yeah. just for a second? Oh, the bottom? Yeah. We'll get back to Kevin Hines in a second. So, so my my lovely partner Joan, he, he, she, she's got an addiction to KGW news on the iPad, mm -hmm. like you know, twenty times a day. Is this the video? Uh, to I exaggerate. Just, just go ahead. Live just, sports, so you never miss a goal. Sorry about the ads. No, just it's go ahead and stop. Right? Oh, you'll never know when you'll okay. Be. Just scroll down the page a little bit. We're not going to watch the video. Okay, if you can stop right there. The man who planned to commit suicide at the top of the mountain. He changed his mind. And then he called in, and they did this dramatic rescue with this helicopter, and that's what that video is about. You know, oh, they had to, they had to make this special landing. I had never heard. Of, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, it was not like a landing on its on its feet. It was well. If you look at the video, you'll see it. And that, they, that, that's what the whole video was about. It wasn't about this poor guy. He was in hell, right? It was all about the wonderful thing the helicopter did. <laughs> it says, the Falcons County Sheriff noticed that the climber had gone up to the summit of Mount Hood because he was going to end his life up there, and then he changed his mind, and then he called for help. So um, this was just sent to me. What does this say? Can you read the date? July 16th? Yeah. Well, that's the day I, that's the day I came here and talked. Yeah. No. Wow. 9 wow. 4 a.m. It, it was originally published at 1030 a.m. on the 13th. It was right before I gave the first talk. Huh. So this was just sent to me by John. You can... You know, I guess you're all going to get this live, so you can go back and click on that and look at the yeah. daring helicopter rescue. But what? Click the link anyway. I have a few more minutes. You can. Ed will end in six seconds. So it begins the from Xfinity. It makes your life simple and awesome. 
lit call for being restored today. This is a rare sight. Even the first time we've seen it on Mount Hood. A massive Chinook helicopter hovering on the edge of Mount Hood's summit. It's called wow. a pinnacle maneuver and is used when the huge machine cannot safely land. With its ramp stretched out onto the mountain at more than 11,000 feet, the PJs on board crawled out on hands and knees to reach the men on the mountain. Joshua Cruz from the 304th Rescue Squadron was part of the team. For the folks at home, it's incredible to see a helicopter on the side yeah. of the mountain like that. What was yeah. it like for you? Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's kind of surreal, but uh, you just have to trust the pilots know what they're doing. The crew is really talking them on correctly, and uh, these 47s have so much power that it makes our job so much easier. Normally, we see smaller, more nimble Blackhawk helicopters make rescues on Mount Hood, but with the altitude, wind, and heat, call went out for the bigger, much more powerful Chinook. Walking the injured climber down to the mountain also was not an option in this summer sun. This time of day, uh, it, the, the mountain just starts to fall apart. Everything's melting. Ice and rock is coming off the mountain. You know, it can really turn into good analogies like a bowling alley. So We often see helicopters use a winch on Mount Hood rescues, but this particular Army helicopter was not set up that way. There was talk of flying to Lewis McCord Field in Tacoma to get the equipment but then the decision was made to do the pinnacle. It made for some intense moments for those going onto the mountain. We just got to jump out and make sure that we can anchor in pretty good. Um, and then make sure we're not blowing people off the mountain. So they were, these guys are still not to get out there. You were in the back. Luckily, he could walk. Back on the ground, the Army Reserve who was rescued, thanked crew members, then got in an ambulance for a trip to a Portland hospital. That's the guy, right? The snow. So we're told the reservist uh, intended to take his life when he <laughs> the summit and then changed his mind, and so he did that rescue. Besides the air crew and the PJs, we should give props to Portland Mountain Rescue, who sent six climbers up overnight, who found that climber who was stuck up there, stayed with him until the rescue came, and they all came down in that Chinook. Okay. Hopefully a positive, oh. life-changing event. It's not Seriously. just any. Anyway. Oh, well, uh, I'm never miss a goal. Yeah, I was trying to, uh, yeah. It's DVR show. Close the window. Sorry. Know. There you yeah, go. Okay. So anyway, I know, I wasn't going to say that to you, but it was kind of cool, the maneuver. It was only a two-minute video. But, <laughs> but, but the point is, there is ambivalence, right? Of course, nothing mm -hmm. about him. Right? It's all about the great rescue mm -hmm. thing. But All right. So now... Uh, Kevin Hines was at this conference in person. Yeah, over in Bend at the Gobi conference. Right, yes, yeah, okay, yeah. so you've already seen him. Well, but, but he no, no. Wasn't there. Oh, people whoops, sorry. Call people. He wasn't there um, because uh, that was the reason that he didn't come. He, he was having there. some health challenges. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, this is called I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge at this point. Six million. You've got your heart up, Douglas. And uh, 17 million subscribers to BuzzFeed, which is a really good. I feel oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. St I was okay, trying to so, put yeah. it back. So it's only five minutes, but this is just. I showed this. Uh, I got the Sharon Keen seal of approval on this one. I love this video. So she said it was good. So <laughs> I want to see if I can get it all the way to the beginning again. Yeah, yeah there we go. Here we go. And. We have lost far too many lives. Oh, come on. I don't know. You're okay. It's, it's working. Just put okay. it on play again. Look at yeah. that triangle. The space the path to this day. Since 1937, over 2,000 people have died at the Golden Gate Bridge. I feel lucky to be alive every single day. For the thousands that have died off the Golden Gate Bridge, I am of the 1% who have survived. So I was born on drugs and premature. And then I bounced around from home to home. Nobody wanted to keep me because I was sick. And I got lucky. I landed in the home of Patrick and Deborah Hines. I had a great childhood. I thought, growing up, that everything's going to be great. And at 17, it, it all came crashing down. If you can imagine feeling that everyone around you is out to get you, trying to hurt you, and trying to kill you, and you believe that to be the truth. From the extreme paranoia, I exhibited symptoms of mania. From the mania came 
the hallucination is both auditory and visual. And so with that and the bipolar disorder, I just was spiraling out of control. I vividly remember writing my suicide note. People don't get it. Like, I, I thought I was a burden to everyone who loved me. Uh, because that's what my brain told me, because that's how powerful your brain is. I got off the bus. I walked slowly down the walkway of the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, people drove by, drove by me, walked by me, and a woman approached me. And she said, do you take my picture? She said, thanks, and she walked away. And the moment I just said, nobody cares. The reality was that everybody cared. I ran forward, using my two hands. I catapulted myself into free form. What I'm about to say is the exact same thing that 19 Golden Gate Bridge jump survivors have also said. The millisecond my hands left the rail, it was an instant regret. And I remember thinking, I was going to know that I didn't want to die. In four seconds, I fell 75 miles an hour, 25 stories, and I hit the water. Um, I was in the most physical pain I had ever experienced. I have ever experienced. The Coast Guard was amazing. Uh, he was just so freaked out that I was alive that he just dove in and brought me on board. And I said, do you know how many people we pull out of this water that are already dead? And I said, no, and I don't want to know. And I put his hand on my forehead and said, kid, you're a miracle. My father took one step into the hospital room, and I looked up at him, and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he said, no, Kevin, I'm sorry. And if you think about it, both of our immediate reactions were guilt. Guilt that didn't belong to either of us. And even though I didn't die, it caused people a great deal of grief and pain. Just the day of my attempt still sits within them today. I asked my father if he still feared my death by suicide. He said, every time the phone goes off, his first inclination is Kevin alive. I had an impact on my dad. So after the jump, uh, the road to recovery was pretty long. I had seven psych ward stays in the next 11 years. I, I still have all the symptoms I ever had. Mania, depression, psychosis, hallucinations, all that's still there. I just know how to cope with it and I know how to beat it. I built a support network over these years of treatment so that I wouldn't be fighting this alone. So like, it's okay not to be okay. It's not okay not to ask for someone to back you up. To the families who, who live with the loss or losses of loved ones, they didn't do that to hurt you or destroy your life. They, they took their lives because they were struggling in a great deal of emotional mental Suicide, mental illness, and addiction are the only diseases that we blame the person for perpetually. But people die from suicide just like they die from any other organ disease. Today, no matter the pain I'm in, no matter the struggles I experience, I do believe that life is the greatest gift we've ever been given. And if you're suffering mentally, don't wait like I did sitting in denial for so long. Because recovery happens. Living proof. I haven't seen that film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin Kevin had a medical event the morning of when he was supposed to come to a vent, mm -hmm. and, and so they gave us the update. But then he Skyped in from his car and yeah. did this amazing interaction with the group. Uh, yeah. yeah, amazing. You know how to contact him? He must be, since you guys were at the conference. Yeah, even like when we were at Alternatives last year, he had a table of people that were, I still have the wristband that the Kevin Hines story, they really, they really, uh, you know, he gets the word out really well. Oh, yeah. well he, was, he was interviewed by Logan Paul, who no one over the age of 25 has ever heard of, but I only heard of it because um, I know someone who's under 25. He's a, uh, if you, uh, he has like 16 million subscribers, something ridiculous, and when he posts a video, it gets 6 million views. Most of them are between 14 and 20 teenagers and anyway he went to the uh japanese uh this forest in japan where people go to die yeah. by suicide and he photographed a man mm -hmm. hanging who had just killed himself hanging on the tree and 
posted it as a thumbnail for his new video and, you know, made some comments that were very, not very tasteful. Oh, wow. So the entire YouTube, um, he, like, revolted. And uh, he was uh, castigated, you know, banned, shamed. And so he came back with a video to do penance where he talked about suicide prevention. And the whole video was about his interview with Kevin Hines. So huh. his 16 million subscribers got to see Kevin Hines for about three minutes. So it was probably worth his, his mess up uh, just so he could, um, you know, get Kevin more exposure. Um, Oops. All right. So um, I guess we go to the next slide then, right? I, I did. <laughs> okay. So here's something. Uh, there's a there's a link to this article. Don't they look nice? Yeah. So the guy on the left, Benjamin, was um, he was uh, um, suffering from again mental mental health issues, and he went to this bridge, in, I think the Waterloo Bridge in London. To go ahead and take it online. And uh, this guy named Neil Laburn on the uh, on the right side was just walking on his way to work. And he sees this guy, you know, right. So, initials on the guy. He went over to him. He says, uh, This is what he did. He says, I was on my own world. Have you ever been over to Ben? Sorry, guys. Can you please mute your microphones if you're speaking? Mute your microphones, please. Relatives I haven't seen for a long time, nieces and nephews and cousins. And George, we can. Oh, yeah, my nephew got married. And he's really nice, cool. Guy. Are you able to? Yeah, you can mute George. Yeah, mute George. It was probably. <laughs> wow. It was an outdoor wedding in her. That's right. It was. Oh, there he is. Gone. You did it. <laughs> Hi, George. Hi, George. Okay, anyway, yeah. uh, so he had been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder in 2008, 10 years ago. Anyway, I was standing in my own world. I was in my own world standing at the bridge trying to find the right point to jump. So this guy comes up to him and he says, just six words or seven words. It'll get better, mate. You'll get better. That's what he said. He said, when he came along, it burst the bubble of the world I was in. I felt faith like I could talk to him. So the... Um, so Neil said, hey, you know, let's go for a cup of coffee. Uh, so <laughs> climbed down the, the uh, bridge. Before the two could go to a cup of coffee, the police came and, and, and took the guy and who knows where. So six years later, Johnny Benjamin on the left is now feeling a lot better. And he wants to track down <laughs> this stranger who um, helped him. Wow. So they had an at find my campaign. I have no idea why that was called, but it was, it was a campaign. And they finally uh, reached the guy. They connected, and there they are, reunited um, uh, six years after the attempt, 2014. Wow. So this whole article from the Telegraph, if you click on the, the article, the link, not now, but when you go on your own, you can read the whole article about the reunion. Now, th there's an interesting uh, kind of epilogue to this, that after they got reunited, they actually became friends, and now they work for uh, this organization, this mental health awareness organization in Great Britain, uh, and they kind of go around, and um, they're actually employed as co-workers. It, it's wow. called, um, I have it actually have it on my computer. I'll show it to you in just a second. But anyway, so from from this kind of chance meeting of these two strangers, now they've built into a lifelong friendship admission. So it didn't take, you know, it didn't take too much for him to change his mind. It'll get better, mate. You'll get better. All he needed was some one person to go up to him and just express empathy. Like 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 if someone had come up to Kevin Hines on the bridge and said it'll get better. The same thing would have happened. So so you see that most of these people are just they're just crying out for some sort of support. So I guess when they call the warm line, that you know, most people I know are not in severe crisis, but the, when a person is and calls, that's what they're looking for. Just someone to say, it'll get better. I know what it's like to be in pain. You know, they don't need they don't need the you know the um Encyclopedia Britannica, right? They just need a couple of choice, empathetic words. So, uh, you know, so you can see that that was, um, anyway, you, they're huge celebrities in Great Britain, so as you can imagine. Wow. But another very heartwarming story, don't you think? Yeah. Look how happy they look. <laughs> Is that the basic reason why phone support can be effective, right, in the here and the now and the 
person wants to leave and at the end of the conversation they're talking about something else feeling a lot better uh, kind of the nature of when I had my breakdown in 82 83 I would get up in the morning and, and be so anxious I, I wanted to put my hand through the window so what I did is I back then there were no such things as cordless phones I don't know if anybody was around. I don't, yeah. I'm sure some of you were. Oh yeah. Joking. yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> some of us. And, and my and my Monday night support group, nobody was. They were all born in the '90s. But anyway, um, I went. And, I ran the hot water in the bathtub. Then I got this court, this phone with this huge, you know, extension on the on the you know the little thing, the phone. What is that? The, the, the curly wire that I don't know. You have the phone, you have cord. the face, and you have cord. the cord. Yeah. And I would hop in the warm water, and then I would call the Lane County Crisis Line in Eugene. And, oh. I, and I'd spend an hour talking about how suicidal I was. And by the end of the hour, I was mellow enough I could get out of the bathtub oh. and do all my day. I did that every day for months. So, yes. So my go-to has always been and will always be talking to somebody. And I really like the phone. I'm an auditory person. The first job I've ever had in my life was working on the phone and uh, – People used to make fun of me when I first found out cell phones existed. It was, you know, like attached to my ear. So, but yeah, I, I, I think that phone support is like amazing and very effective, especially people who are auditory like myself. So, uh, it worked every time. I mean, whenever I called, there was always somebody who was there to calm me down. Nice. And my breakdown in 2015, three years ago. In Portland, I did the same thing with the mobile mechanic crisis line. Get up in the middle of the night, couldn't go back to sleep, was panicking, and I'd call. Of course, I got tired of me after a while. We cannot give medical advice. Don't ask us about Ambien. All right, no. I'm just, I'm <laughs> talk to so, yeah, does that, does that answer your question? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 just, I, I, just a compassionate, loving voice is, you know, what did he say? He said, it'll get better, mate. You'll get better. That's it. That's all he said. And the guy climbed right down the bridge. It bursts the bubble. Now, that's, see, that's interesting because I mentioned in, my, in this book here that it, like being suicidal is like being in a tunnel with both ends you know, cut off and signs read no exit. So you're in this, this container of hopelessness, and there's, there's no way that you can see out. And someone comes along and kind of – it's almost like someone opens the door to one end of the tunnel and lets the light in. Mm-hmm. So that's what this guy did when he came up to Johnny Benjamin on the bridge. He said, oh, there's someone out there who, you know, who, who's telling me that things will get better. <laughs> and um, so this reminds me of a, of a book I should have brought, uh, a play, one-act play that you guys, I'm sure, sorry you guys didn't see it. It was in Portland briefly, Portland Center Stage, called Every Brilliant Thing. Anybody subscribe to HBO? Mm-hmm. I do. Who does? I do. You should go get I'll send you the link. They have uh, an off-Broadway show, won all these prizes. Mm -hmm. It's a one-man show about a guy whose mother tried to commit suicide when he was about eight, and he made a list of every brilliant thing that would make life worth living to keep her alive. What was it called? Every Brilliant Thing. Yeah, I'll I'll send you the link. Okay. Duncan McMillan, Irish playwright. So he says in the middle of this one-man monologue, he says, I have a message for anybody, you know, who's suicidal. Don't do it. Because things will get better. They might not get a lot better, but they'll get a little better, and that will be sufficient. So it's a very similar idea that things will get better. It's a very You'll be very fortunate you saw this play. It's, um, hmm. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and it should, it, should have, it should have gone to more theaters in America, really. Mm-hmm. Okay, so belongingness being a protective factor. Um, so this guy named... Um, who wrote the, the classic book on suicide, um, Thomas Joyner, Florida State University, called Why People Die by Suicide. And he says one of the three reasons is what he calls failed belongingness. That means, like, she doesn't love me anymore. He doesn't love me anymore. I mean, it's the idea of feeling rejected, disconnected from people, disconnected from love. And conversely, uh, when you feel that connection, like happened on the bridge, then that's a protective factor. So I have examples here about um, a woman, one of my Facebook fans, when she first contacted me, uh, she said, I have to tell you that I was going to kill myself uh, five years ago, but then I had a six-year-old child, and I just 
couldn't leave her behind. So mm -hmm. now she's loving, she's the love of my life. So there's one example. Mm -hmm. Then Seneca, who was this famous Roman philosopher who was in Stoic, he was a major proponent of suicide. And he was sick and he was ready to die, but then he refrained because his father, he was concerned of the impact his death might have on his father. Even though he philosophically believed in suicide as a way out, he, he, he again, it was his connection to his father. And then, um, oh yeah, yeah, this is, do I have this in the notes? Wait a minute, we're in part three? I don't think so. No, you, I think this yeah. is still part two. You had mentioned halfway through part two. Yeah, we're still on we're still on part two. Well, yeah. Um, I, I this is from the Christian Science Monitor. I'm, I'm, let me see if I have this in my own notes. I, I want to read this if I can because it's so amazing. Um, so, you remember when Anthony Bourdain died by suicide in Case Spade? All the all these articles came out, and this mm -hmm. was Christopher. So, this is an article about. Uh, the high rates of suicide in Montana and uh, the western states. Why do you think that is? Why is it higher than any other place? Three reasons. Access to guns. Oh, yeah. Middle-aged men. And, and crummy male health services. So this is a guy, an, ar an army guy, I thought of you. His name is Matt Kuhn. Stood on the chair in his attic with one rope end of the rope around his neck. It was 2000, and Mr. Cohn's 22 found his nation's army career ruined after he shredded ankle ligaments during a training exercise. The West Point graduate had dreamed of a life in uniform since childhood. The abrupt demise of his military ambitions pushed him toward the void. Kind of fell along this, right? This, this was going to be his life in the army, right? Purpose, yeah. My sense of being, of being was broken, said Cohn's, a native of Helena, Montana who now serves as the executive director of the state's chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. Mm. Obviously, he didn't go through it. So here's, here's, he stopped himself from stepping off the chair only when he realized he had yet to pay his monthly rent. He felt obligated to his landlords for the burden his death would impose since the exact due rent. So he walked outside, slipped a check in the nearby mailbox, then walked back wow. and stepped off the chair again. But he happened to hear his neighbor crying and then couldn't... Uh. Approach and asked what was wrong. The man began to pour forth his marital troubles for two hours. <laughs> Hunt sat on the neighbor's porch and listened. And while he shared nothing of his own struggle, the chance exchange broke the closed loop of suicidal thoughts. He went home and took down the news. Wow, that's connection. pretty cool. Connection, yeah, yep. connection. Connection is big. His listen to his neighbor's, you know, lament, and then he went down the. I mean, that was so powerful, that story in the Christian Center. I mean, I can't, I mean, so now he's the executive director of NAMI, and, you know, he's, uh, that was uh, 2000, so what is it now, 2018? So yeah. he's now 40. Yeah, right, he was 22, so he's now 40 years old, so he's in that big shot at NAMI in Montana. And um, <laughs> that, that was such a powerful story. So two things happened. One, he didn't want to let the landlord down. They wanted to pay his rent. I get the yeah, army guy, right? A conscientious, do your duty, right? Good sense of character and ethics. And, and then he saw this guy crying and wanted to help him out. So um, he didn't realize he was practicing intentional peer support. He was practicing <laughs> unintentional peer support. <laughs> yeah. It works. Ac accidental peer support. Accidental yeah. peer support. All right. So, okay, we can go to the next slide. So if I can't get to it. I need to hold on. What's that? You need to hold on? I mean, no, that's in the oh, slide. No. Oh, no, they need to hold on. on. <laughs> I'm like, so, we do need to hold on? Why? Right, right, right. <laughs> so the fact that everything changes means that if you hold on, things will get better. That's what Neil said to Johnny and the Beards. That's what the guy, the guy from Every Brilliant Thing. I'll send everybody the link. Maybe you can give them your password to HBO and they can crash you know, crack into your account. <laughs> cool. uh, if you're so inclined. Really? So, <laughs> the man who, in a fit of melancholy, kills himself today would have wished to have to live had he waited a week, said Voltaire. And Matt Haig, from his amazing memoir, Reasons to Stay Alive, minds have their own weather systems. You're in a hurricane. Hurricanes run out of energy eventually. Mm. Hold on. Nice. An amazing, amazing weather. So, that's a nice. So, thing. here's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, that says it, right? Mm -hmm. Hurricanes run out of energy eventually. 
Yeah. I mean, it seems such a simple concept, but it is it is the key to, to um, suicide prevention is to give it some time. So uh, I had a guy in my group around 2006. Okay, so the other thing that um, uh, right. Joyner talks about. I can't. I can't. Focus. Oh, it's still there. Yeah, little, yeah. Little it came sweater. back. <laughs> it's like sweater fuzz or something. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you guys over there. I know you were all obsessing about it. We were all, th all three of us were going. To get the little dangler. I hope, it, I hope you were able to listen to the last story. Yes, oh, yes. absolutely. Anyway, um, so this guy named Reed. Okay, so fell belongingness. And the other thing he says is feeling of being a burden to others. So he was 43 years old living with his mother. Because he couldn't work, because he was, you know, bipolar and he was a mess, and he felt so embarrassed that at age 43 he was living with his parents. I have a bunch of guys in my groups right now that are 45 living with their parents. Anyway, he felt ashamed of himself, a loser, a failure. But he had applied to get Social Security disability, which he had worked a lot. So, you know, if he were approved. You know, they do all the back pay. Has anyone ever applied to SSD besides yeah. me? Mm -hmm. You know what it's like, right? If you apply on April 1st and you get approved in November, they yeah. all the, all they pay you back, all the back pay, all the way back to April 1st when you apply. Kind of like unemployment insurance. Anyway, we tell them, you know, hang in there, you know, you never know, you might get it. And um, so on Tuesday night, the group, he said he was feeling better. Wednesday, he went to the uh, IOP program at St. Vincent's, and somebody said something in that program that triggered him, went home, and uh, at about 2 a.m., he, he jumped off the Fremont Bridge, died by suicide. Mm -hmm. The only person I've ever lost. I mean, I've, it wasn't I who lost. I mean, oh, he was, I mean, and of course, you know, the survivor go, what could I have done? Well, he said things were cool on Tuesday. There's no way I could have known. It was an impulsive thing. If there had been a barrier in the Fremont Bridge, he'd still be alive. And uh, so... When you know it, the next week a letter comes and says the Social Security Administration, we're happy to announce you've been approved for me. Uh, $2,100 wow. a month and we have $10,000 back. And so if he only had waited seven days, right? But So my my thing is why didn't he call me or why didn't he call his counselor or why didn't he call the suicide hotline? You know, what was it that, that prevented him from – he must have just felt from whatever triggered him at that meeting – Enough is enough. And because it was 2 a.m. in the morning in the Cremont Bridge, nobody was around to basically come up to him and say, you know, hey, you should think about it. So I, I, that's very, very tragic. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, what can you do? Um, but it, it does show, again, how if you can hold on, weather systems change. And he, I, I knew he was going to get his money. Shit, the guy hadn't worked in years. And you know, he had a list of psychiatrists. He, he had everything on paper. It was, it was a... But he just couldn't do it. So I mean, and you know, so it's, it was a sad thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we are. If you can hold on, you return to the light, right? The next slide. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I got that from that website. Free photo. Nice. Very nice. Very hopeful. The dawn comes. Okay, so letting. So now we're finally at part three, and. Um, So, um, a lot of the information I got here was from a talk that was given in Oregon City. Has anyone ever heard of Oregon City? I'm joking. It's right around the corner, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. You should go to their website. I'll send Sharon the websites of the three major suicide prevention organizations in the United States. That being the most important. It's called Talk Saves Lives. So this was a talk, not about talking to people over the phone, but about talking to people in person. But it's, I'm sure it still holds. So they said, ask directly if the person is considering. So if you, if you feel like, if you know someone, they've been depressed, they, they're withdrawing from life, they have said things like, okay, so there was a, in part one, there was a whole thing of warning signs of suicide. So if they displayed any of those things like, you know, giving away prized possessions and you know, withdrawing from friends and all the other things we've listed, uh, you, you could ask them, you know, are you considering, thought, you might say, 
are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? Talking about suicide won't plant the idea in someone's mind. The person may in fact feel great relief about being able to talk about the pain. And Joseph Richmond says, professor of psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine says, in fact, asking a person if they're suicidal could prevent suicide uh, because a suicidal person feels isolated and alienated. The fact that someone is concerned can have a healing effect. So I guess in terms of people calling in, is that something any of you would ever do if you felt someone might be in a suicidal state just broaching the subject? Because yeah. if I'm feeling like a million, if I wake up at the, today and I say, my God, Today's my wedding day. I'm in love with this woman. And someone says, you feeling suicidal? I'll say, you psychotic? I mean, you can't, if someone's in a good mood, you can't ask that question and make them, you know, you, you can't, the question cannot make somebody feel that way if they're not feeling that way. Right. Nobody would think that way unless they were in a lot of pain. And asking a question cannot do that. So you said you've asked them? So yeah, does, that, does that have to help? What did the person say? What did, what did the person say? They were feeling suicidal. Okay. And yeah. talk them down. Right. So the fact you asked the question was good because then yeah. you were able to get them to start the conversation. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the whole point of this slide. So if you think if you're if someone's calling up and you're concerned, well, how 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 would you know when the first half of this first third? You know, I listed all the, the warning signs, and you know, you can get that off the AFS. You can get them anywhere, but they're all pretty well documented in part one of this uh, slideshow. Why? Because I stole them from the AFSP website. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever hear Mark Twain? Sure, right? Mm -hmm. When I started to write, I would look up advice on writing. I found something that Mark Twain said. Great. Good writers borrow, but great writers steal. So, <laughs> Abby Hoffman, back in my generation, had a book called Steal This Book, right? So, That's right. I stole, I stole all this from the AFSP. So, what did you say? I said I was a great author then in college. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I still have <laughs> right, Yeah, yeah, right, right. You mean you stole people's ideas. Yeah. That's called plagiarism. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's called information gathering. So when I was, so when I was a kid, we had something called the World Book Encyclopedia. <laughs> it, was all, it wasn't like the Britannic. It was in pictures and it was wonderful. So anybody, time anybody had to do a, 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 like a term or paper in oh, sixth yeah. grade, yes. you'd get the war book, you'd copy stuff out. It was great. You got A's. Okay, <laughs> fast forward from, 1960, <laughs> from 1958. Let's go all the way to 2008. What, is that 50 years? Come oh, God. So my goddaughter is in, 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 uh, going to the school, and she has a report due, and she said she needed help. So I went to, well, the Britannica doesn't exist anymore. Well, let's go to Wikipedia. So I found some stuff, put it, you know, in her, her, her you know, uh, pay, pay for thinking it was just like the world book. She gets to know from the teacher. You took this from Wikipedia without revealing your source. We're going to expel you from school. We're going to have a trial here. They had a trial. They put her on trial. The only way that she basically got out of it was, it was Douglas Block who did that. <sighs> Guilty. So then they, I was, a, I was a tutor that they, they forbid me ever to come back and tutor again. Oh, I think they overreacted. Bad. Was, it, was, yeah. it, it was an innocent, yeah. it was an innocent try to help. But the fact is, in this day and age, <laughs> you ha for the, you, for people, if you have any daughters, sons, or people, young people who are in college or high school. And they're getting information from places like Wikipedia. You have to cite your source. Yeah, you cannot steal anymore. Mark Twain no. is out of the picture. <laughs> right. he, he's been rendered, you know, extinct. Anyway, so yes. Um, okay, so that was that was a digression. Uh, don't act shocked or disapproving if the answer is suicidal. Is yes. Don't lecture on suicidal individual about morality of morality of suicide about the value of life. Don't try to talk the person out of their feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. what do you guys call reflectively? We used to call it in, in college active listening. Oh, you must feel being feeling hopeless. You must, you must have some tough things going on in your life. You don't say, why would you ever do a thing like that? I know you know this. But, yeah. you know, life is precious. Besides, if you're a Catholic, you'll go to hell. Uh, well, that's what they used to tell Catholics. <laughs> Any Catholics here? I was Catholic. You were? He's a recovering Catholic. He is? No. In intentional peer support, it's not like classical I, I I, peer support with that reflective listening. I mean, I, I was my, trained I in that, too. In my car. Oh, my God. I may have to take a break and go get it because I'm paranoid. Of, um, unless someone is willing to. You know, someone told me they once had their... their, 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 their you would? Sure. Because I had a, a, cat, a joke for Catholics on my phone, and I just realized <laughs> I don't have the phone. So yeah. if you walk out of here... 
make a left turn on the left going, what is it, north, you'll see a Honda Accord Silver LX with a, with a um, what is it called, a roof rack. You can use my keys to open it, and okay. on the front seat will be an iPhone. Okay. The only it, kind it, of phone. What'd you say? The only kind of phone. Okay, well, the only kind of phone. But the joke was on the phone. And don't say it wasn't there. Can you, you get by? I want to get your phone to see if you yeah, Otherwise, yeah. I might have to call the Mahoma Crisis. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll help you on the war line. <laughs> yeah. that'd, be, that'd be good for us okay, to see what that so, looks uh, like. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a phone on you? Yeah. Um, call Sharon if you can't find it. Okay. Actually, it's in the, yeah. silver, it's the silver Honda. Left. When you go out the door, make a left and a immediate left, and you'll see it on the right. It's, it's on the street that's over here. Yeah, it's yeah. on the right side. It's about the first one in. Okay. You'll see it. Silver Honda. Mm. Yeah, with, a, with one of those things on the what is it called in the trunk of the the, the, um, the fancy thing on the I don't know. Spoiler. Huh? Spoiler. Spoiler, yeah. Okay. Spoiler thing. <laughs> so does that make sense about not talking people out of their feelings? Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say like we don't use the phrase reflective listening as much, but if people are practicing the principles and tasks of intentional peer support, then they're they're gonna be learning with the person and exploring how why you know, how they came to feel or think the way that they're thinking and feeling. So I think that's kind of how it would look in our framework. Yeah. It made me kind of think about from helping to learning. Yeah. So like I wouldn't talk them out of their feelings, but I might ask them what that means to them. What does suicide mean to them? Like I know what I I know what suicide is what in my definition, but I might ask the individual, um, you know, what does that look like for you? Because it might mean they have a plan and um but it also might just mean that they're feeling overwhelmed. Yeah, that's suicidal ideation, which we'll go into. It just means when you have suicidal ideation, you think about it, but you're not really planning on doing it. Right. It's just a function of how desperate you feel. You obsess about it, but you're not in any immediate danger, but you can't get the thoughts out of your mind because it seems like it's the only thing to do. Um, okay, so let's go, go, go to forward. the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Whoops, trying to. Oh. Okay, show compassion, I... understanding, express concern and willingness to help. This builds rapport. Then let your caller do most of the talking so they can tell their story and let you know what's happening in their world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's something from Kevin Briggs that you can click on. Before you, I'll just tell you the backstory. It's only 30 seconds, but it's from uh, a, a video on, on TED Talks. He worked for 20 some odd years on the Golden Gate Bridge as a, a, and I guess it wasn't police, it was some sort of traffic patrol. Anyway, he talked like 200 people down from jumping off the bridge. Wow. So, so click on that, yeah. So okay. he's just gonna. So he, it's, a, it's a 14 minute talk, as you can see, but we're only gonna listen to about 20 seconds. I pose these questions to you. What would you do if your family member, friend, or loved one was suicidal? What would you say? Would you know what to say? In my experience, it's not just the talking that you do, but the listening. Listen to understand. Don't argue, blame, or tell the person you know how they feel, because you probably don't. By just being there, you may just be the turning point that they need. If you think someone is suicidal, don't be afraid to confront them and ask the question. One way of asking the question is like this. Others in similar circumstances have thought about ending their life. Have you had these thoughts? Confronting the person head on may just save their life and be the turning point for them. Some other signs to look okay. for. Hopelessness. Believing that things are... Anyway, that was quite quick. The most important thing he, that he's saying there is just listening and just being, being you know, a presence. It's taking that guy so long. Does <laughs> anybody have a Zanuck? Wow, how did you do that? Nope. He's young. 
He's young and coordinated is what he's... He is. Yeah, he is. <laughs> so, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Should I go? Oh, reflective oh, listening. Wait a minute. Okay, got it. Okay, well, engage in reflective listening. For example, the caller says, I don't see any reason to live. And I respond with, it seems like you're trying to help us. The fact that listening tells them that you're hearing and understanding their concerns, which in turn builds trust. It's about creating space for people to share their feelings. Do you, you mind sure speaking more loudly? I'm concerned oh, sure. about oh, oh, yeah, I can no, no, hear mumbling. I'm yeah. mumbling. Yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, they're looking at the same slide I am, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Right. But okay, but I'll yeah. speak louder, no problem. Thanks. Should I look into the camera? <laughs> I don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> That car was only that car was only about like ten seconds out the door. What what is taking this guy so long? Oh no, he must have found something else to do. <laughs> All right, I'll focus on the next he slide. He could be saving someone's life. <laughs> or he could be driving my car to Reno. Yeah, it could. <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> okay, so is that slide, you know? Okay, so now we're getting to this idea of suicidal ideation. Oh. The person is thinking about suicide but not planning on taking the action. It's very common when people are severely depressed. The person might think, I feel hopeless or I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up or people would be better off without me. So that's, those are just, you know, I, I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up or, you know, if I die tomorrow would be okay. So they're just, they're thinking about it but not in any active way. Mm -hmm. Has anybody had that? I do. Mm -hmm. I have. Yeah. So how was that when you were doing that? How did you uh, like soothe yourself or you know help yourself feel better? I think for other people. Mm -hmm. You mean you reach out to others? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anybody else ever been in that state? What's the question again? Thinking about suicide. Just sort of. Yeah, it's wishing. like the word idea. Just thinking about it, oh, wishing, wishing you could be dead. Millions of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so not millions, but Quite millions. Yeah. So, so when if you ask someone, have you been thinking about suicide, and they say yes, that's suicidal ideation. So, then I guess it's your it's your job to see. You know, if if that's all they're doing, or if they have something else they're thinking of doing after that. Because if that's all they're doing. Then you just talk to them and listen to their problems and you know give them some compassion and hopefully they'll you know start to feel less hopeless and the suicidal ideation will die down on its own just by getting that sense of you know connection. Um, so there was a gal in my in my group in 2016. She uh, her father the previous year had died by suicide. I sent her into five hospitalizations in eight months. And she came to the group, and every morning she would wake up and she would call me. I can't get suicide out of my mind. I'm not thinking about doing it. I just can't stop thinking about it. This went on November, December, January, and then she took a medication that, that helped. But uh, it's like every morning that's what this person went through. And then by the middle of the day, it subsided. But she was she was sort of you know plagued by that. You ever had that happen? Like periods of time, stretches, yeah. yeah. I had that happen in my 96, 97 break, and I had a rhyme, suicidal ideation is a hit across the nation. How's that for obsessive rhyming? Nice. Yeah. I was diagnosed as major depression with psychotic features. <laughs> I've seen those features uh, I, I also said electric times. shock for Douglas Clark. <laughs> that was 2016. Sure enough, 19 years later, I got it. I, I'm, I'm a prophet. <laughs> I prophesied that, right? What else did I say? Um, the river sticks in '96. People were very amused by these rhymes I had, <laughs> but it was, it was um, just a function of how um, distressed that was, just a way of letting out the distress. Um, so suicidal ideation is. I went out to lunch. Great car. The <laughs> car alarm went off. It took me this long to get your car alarm. Really? Yeah. But didn't you open up with the, the keys? 
<laughs> I, I have lots of, lots of help. So. Ed gets I'm sorry back. about that. I, I am, okay. So that's why I gave you the keys. I'm so yeah. sorry. Huh. No, I did something I'm sure that wasn't the right thing to do with your keys. <sighs> We're good. We're good. It all helped. It all got. Yeah. <sighs> well, that was that was your exciting. That was exciting. Today. Yeah. yeah. It was definitely got exciting. your adrenaline up. Yeah. They had Everything. some new friends. <laughs> Anyway, um, well, should I tell this? Uh, I always believe in humors. Should I tell this joke, Catholic joke or not? Would it be out of keeping with this, you know, this serious presentation? Thank you. I'll tell yeah. it now. Thank you. I, I, I don't think of, my wife, who's very sensitive, didn't think it was funny. Okay. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I've been with a loose girl. The priest asked. Is that you, little Joey, Joey Pagano? This is like from the East Coast. They're all town mm -hmm. Catholics. Yes, Father, it is. And who was the girl you were with? I can't tell you, Father. I don't want to ruin her reputation. Um, well, Joey, I'm sure to find out sooner or later. So you might as well tell me now. Was it Tina Minetti? I cannot say. Was it Teresa Mazzarelli? I'll never tell. Was it Nita Capelli? I'm sorry, but I cannot name her. Was it Kathy Pirano? My lips are sealed. Was it Rosie D'Angelo then? Please, Father, I cannot tell you. The priest's eyes in frustration. You're very tight-lipped, and I admire that, but you've sinned and, and have to atone. You cannot be an older boy now for four months. Now, you go and behave yourself. Joey walks back to his pew, and his friend Franco slides over with his What do you get? Joey replies, four months vacation and five good leads. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. 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 That was risky. That was risky. That was risky. That was risky. Yeah. I know that was, that was, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did not mean to send any women at all. I apologize. No, I can see the vacation coming, but the no leads. Are right. Yeah. <laughs> My good leads. Anyway, I am, um, I like jokes because they're, they have, they have surprise endings. Anyway, I, I, it, that was probably not the most political. Not a good me too yeah. choice. No, no, but not I, a good no, me too choice. Know, not a good me too choice. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that was in that culture. Hey, Billy Joel had a song called that he was criticized for uh, called uh, Only the Good Die Young. It was all about mm -hmm. that. Remember that song? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah maybe he was criticized about that very thing. Mm -hmm. But it's part of that culture. That's the only reason. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Enough. Let's all go right. to the next slide. Looking for barriers to suicide. If a person is feeling hopeless, ask them, what's helping keeping you alive? This is called looking for barriers. Barriers can include fear of death, fear of harming loved ones, fear of a failed attempt that could render the person disabled, or fear of leaving a pet. So um, this is important. Are there any reasons? Is there anything in your life that's you know going well? Is there anything that's keeping you alive? Like my friend Danielle said, I have a child. I, I, I have to be here for it. Or what's his name? Seneca said, uh, my father is ill. So even though I philosophically believe in suicide. So one of the things that is a barrier is people's connection, you know, to loved ones, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My parents, yeah. my children, you know, my brother. Now, so in my episode here, um, so there were three barriers for me. One was the healthy fear of dying, right? Which we all have. I mean, many of us have. The other one was um, I happen to believe in the idea of reincarnation uh, so that, um, you know, I felt, well, if I die now, I'm just going to have to face any problems next time around. So it's not really going to solve anything. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing was since I'm a survivor of many people who have died by suicide, um, I was concerned the people, about the people I would leave behind. I knew that if I killed myself, my friends and family would not only be grief-stricken, but angry and guilty as well. Why should I drag all these people into my nightmare, I thought. Uh, so I went ahead and told this to the, um, the lifeguard, the pool I swam in, and she said, good thinking, Doug. Other people are a good reason to stay alive. So I never forgot that. She was very helpful, the lifeguard. So yeah, that's one barrier. Um, can anybody else think of another barrier that might uh, one of your callers might say something that's keeping them alive, something that's um, you know acting as a as a stop sign besides 
I, if you're harming other people. I could imagine if someone was religious, they might think that it was wrong. That's right. You're absolutely, you're brilliant because that's what I wrote about in the book. My therapist said, do you believe that it's a sin to kill yourself? I said, I don't. She said, I'm sorry to hear that because people who do believe it's a sin to kill yourself are much more likely to do so. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I know it. I don't think it's a sin because I've been there and I know how many, how much pain people are in. So, um, uh, you know, I would never condemn anybody. But she said, if you're religious and it's against your religious beliefs, that is a barrier. So you're absolutely right. Like the person with the paycheck, it was their principles that said, oh, i got to get my rent in. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. So, um, so anything that you can find, is, you know, is there anything in your life that, or are there any, you know, I try to get them to get into the ambivalent stage. Is there anything that's going on that, you know, might, you know, prevent you or, or something you feel like you have to live for, something that, some reason, has anyone ever done that? Did any, what were the barriers that people had? A number of people said they were suicidal here. What, what were the number? What were the barriers that people had here? You guys online, I just unmuted you. If anyone has questions or wants to respond, let me tell you last time about the, the rich attorney. I wasn't here. Remember? No. Okay. Well, in March of 2002, this man came to my door. And he was wearing a, a very expensive three-piece suit. He had a, he drove up in a Porsche, had a Rolex watch worth about six fifteen thousand dollars He was young. He was handsome. He was Brazilian. He was, was a famous mm -hmm. soccer player in Brazil, or had been. Mm -hmm. And the night before, he had gone into his garage and hooked up a, a hose from the exhaust pipe into the window to poison himself with carbon monoxide. I said, why did you, why? He said, well, my fiance rejected me and I can't live without her. Loss of love, number one, causes depression, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, why are you here? He said, well, I, I turned on the ignition and, you know, the gas started to come in and I realized I, I hadn't fed my dog. Mm -hmm. There it was, barrier. Cool. <laughs> I don't like dogs, but in this case, I made an exception. Yeah. <laughs> That dog so has anybody yeah. here ever I had feed a, my dog. Have you ever had your own barrier? Do you know anybody else who had a barrier? Have any of your callers talked about a barrier? No, we have talked about a barrier. They talked about suicide and you know their thoughts on it, but yeah. I've never had. Well, you might ask them. Well, is there something that's keeping you here? Or, yeah, is there? Is, is there? Or, or, or is there a reason that, you know, you think, is, is there something on the other side that, that you know, might give you a uh, cause to, you know, think about, it. I mean, to, you know, second thoughts, you know, see if they can bring it up. Oftentimes there's somebody in their lives that they're really, you know, connected to and they wouldn't want to harm that person. But remember belongingness? Mm -hmm. People are connected. People are, we're, we're pack animals, we need each other and, it's a very powerful aspect of survival is to be there for your loved ones. So I think it's important to ask um, what's keeping you here, or there are things you, you know, whatever, however you want to say it. Okay, options for safety. Um, if a person is having suicidal thoughts, a common coping strategy is to put together a wellness safety plan, it can involve a number of coping strategies. What has helped in the past? Does the caller have a wellness plan in place? Does the caller have a relationship with a therapist or doctor? What makes up their circle of support? Sharon's editing on that one. <laughs> and Robin. And Robin. Where's yep. Robin? Right there. Hi, Robin. There you are. Yep. Well, have you ever done that? Have you ever um, asked your callers if they had, uh, um, you know, what type of support do you have, right? And you're, mm -hmm. you're in pain. You're thinking, of, you know, you're thinking about suicide or taking your life. You're obviously feeling somewhat desperate. What in your life can you rely upon for support in your hour? You I know, guarantee you, the 99% of them will say uh, this. Yeah. yeah. Then I should, I'd say, well, I'm really glad you're on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what about this? Uh, have you ever? Have, has there been anything you've ever tried or done that helps decrease the pain a little bit? 
you know, <laughs> taking a brisk walk around the block or, you know, playing a piece of music or, um, you know, um, deep reading. It's, in other words, exactly. tools. Exactly, hot bath. Hot bath, right. Mm -hmm. Have you ever have you ever tried things in your own life that that help you feel better if only for a moment? That's the safety plan. You know, having tools in place, having or what about uh, well, if they say, okay, so what has been supportive this call? Have you ever said, well, do you have a counselor you see, or do you have a, um, a minister, a priest, or someone in your life you can talk to? Do you have a supportive person in your life. It doesn't have to be a professional. Safety plan. Mm -hmm. it, it just means giving the empowering the people to have coping strategies they can use. So when they're off the phone, they can, you know, find some way. Okay, remember that 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 um, picture with the scale, pain here and coping resources on the other right. So suicide happens when the when the pain is greater than the coping resources. If you can pile on stuff on the coping resources part of the scale, it'll go like this. And it will outweigh the pain. So, what are what are coping tools you can use in, in, in your distress? Have you come up with anything? That's the that's the important thing to ask, and see what they say. Or maybe you could even offer some ideas. Mm -hmm. Mostly, mostly it's distraction. Going but dinner, yeah, go I, I, I don't know about you guys, but for myself, I definitely have like a number of different things that I consider wellness tools, and I would not hesitate to share some of the things that I do for myself, and that's just a, it's the way of sharing about it in a way that's kind of not assuming that they're going to want to do the same thing, but just kind of sharing about it. Okay, next slide. Other things that the oh. client might want to consider. Talk oh. to someone who's helped them in the past. Contact their counselor, or therapist. Schedule an emergency session. Does a car want to come alongside them via the phone? Calling their support teachers, or friends, and family to let them know about difficulties. Yeah, so that's the important thing. If a person is is feeling calls you and they say they're feeling suicidal, encourage them to reach out. Encourage them to ask for help, not just on the warm line, but people in their environment. So, who is in your environment that you feel safe enough you can reach out and talk? To? That's done human Yeah. So have, you, have you asked that question? And do people have people they can they can talk to, whether it's a professional or you know, or just someone in their circle, their sphere? Most recent caller that I dealt with, because somebody was on the phone with them, and then they called me for they texted me for support, and I ended up talking to the person also who was having a hard time. She. From the first contact with the warm line until I got on the line with her, uh, found out that her next door neighbor, who was an elderly woman, was willing to come over and actually spend the night in her apartment, and that she found that very comforting. It was so cool that, like, just through kind of talking with us, she figured that out, and that happened, and, and it got her through. <sighs> yeah, I have a guy in my group who's suicidal, and he has an elderly next door neighbor, a woman, and. He comes over and helps him out. It's the same thing, exactly the same idea. That's pretty cool. We need more elderly next door neighbors in this world. <laughs> like a go to list. You know, trust yeah. friends. You have to have a go to list. That's a very good point. You have a list of people you can talk to when you're feeling overwhelmed. If not, maybe we can help you create one right now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Do you have some things you can do that will ease the pain, if only a little bit? Like for me, it's getting on my bike and riding up and down the hills of the neighborhood or, you know, um, calling Silent Unity. Oh, I guess I never told you about my prayer support line. Silent Unity, yeah. I've used that. Yeah. You should let people know about Silent Unity. It, it never fails. You know that number? one 800 669 You've used them? I have, you should, yeah. You should, let the, you should let the operators know about that. Yeah, that is. That's good, an amazing great. resource. Uplifting. Just a prayer. It's, it's, it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week prayer line that's been going on since 1889. And it's a very open uh, sort of, you know, interdenominational. It's, 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 it's non-denominational Christian. They use the word God, but it's more about just using affirmative prayer and just saying, you know, we now see you as being surrounded by the light. You're you're filled with indwelling, you know, energy of hope and revitalization. It's just it's just a bunch of 
really nice a, affirmative no sentences, yeah. and, and the, the people hold a really amazing yes. consciousness. Wow. The people who are there, that's, they have a rich tradition, all the way going back to the 1800s. Unity is an amazing uh, spiritual uh, community in this world. And uh, <laughs> Has anyone ever been to a Unity Church? Yeah. What do you think? They were okay. They're okay. Right? Yeah. They're cool. Yeah. So, um, but uh, no, silent unity is it's it's uh, everybody who I've ever given that number to has called me back and said it was so helpful. And they put you in their church, prayer chapel. They pray for you for thirty days. Right. If you call in, if you in that. I mean, unity. Um. You know, especially if a person has faith, if a, especially if a person has a, a, a spiritual context, then giving them this prayer line or any prayer line, it's huge. I mean, I mean spiritual support is huge. Mm -hmm. If you feel like your higher power is with you, supporting you, uh, that's going to give you a certain comfort that will, you know, really um, uh, counter whatever feelings of despair and hopelessness you have. So if someone has, you know, religious or spiritual path, you should definitely help them to, to use that as an ally in their healing. Yeah. So, but like you said, it's all about having a list of support people to call and, as Sharon said, wellness tools. Because they're going to be off the phone, and when they're off the phone, then they need to basically be able to heal themselves. Right. More coming tries to stay well, have a friend come over and stay until symptoms diminish, right? That's what you said about the woman next door, right? Uh -huh. Do something nurturing for their physical body, such so as going on a long walk, practicing yoga, taking a bath, sitting in a jacuzzi. That's what I used to do. I always would get up, sit in my bathtub, get the phone on, you know, to my ear, and call the crisis line and chat for 45 minutes. I usually have to call Eaton today. Mm. You'd be surprised a lot of them. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a very that's good a that's a very good question, question. Well, It says, yeah, do something nurturing for their physical body, right? So I should have said eating. Yeah. Here, I'm gonna eat this that. Yeah, a lot of people No, no, we have a guy in my group who came and he was having a hard day. So I said, Have you eaten today? He said, No. Have you drunk any fluids in that one? Well, if you're not taking care of your body, of course you can feel miserable. Yeah. Does the caller wish to remove all means of self harm, guns, knives from the caller's immediate? Facility. Uh, so, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But, uh, yeah, according to the New York Times, the number, the, one of the most important ways you can prevent suicide is by simply taking away the means to do it when a person is in an impulsive mood. Makes sense, doesn't it? Mm. Here's a slide I just put in called Coping Strategies for Safety. The goal of suicide is the elimination of pain. A thought or behavior that reduces the person's pain is called a coping strategy. Since suicidal episode is time limited, uh, the task is to employ coping strategies to stay alive one day at a time until the episode ends. Or I should have said feelings are better. I didn't use the word feelings. Sorry. It's okay. But remember, he said uh, he said that uh, Matt K said it's like a hurricane, mm -hmm. which eventually exhausts itself. That image. Where is the caller to happen to his or her resources to come up with helpful coping strategies? So the things we were talking about before, calling people, eating. Calling sound unit, those are all coping strategies. It's all about coping strategy to to balance out the overwhelming pain and to reduce it enough so that you can live for another day. It's all about living. Okay, so then. Um, Oops, is that okay? I just I didn't I just jumped. Yeah, that's it. it seems like if you can just get rid of the stigma around it. Pain, I think, too, that the pain itself isn't necessarily the problem. It's how, how you see it and how you see yourself. Yeah. Well, this guy felt stigmatized because he was living with his mother at age 43. I was living with my parents in my 30s. I was glad they were around. I would I wouldn't have had no place to go if they hadn't taken me in. So, um, but uh, yeah. No shame. Uh, people who are dealing with depression and mental health challenges are often stronger than people who are not. M. Scott Peck said people going to psychotherapy are often more healthy than people who avoid it. So just the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know who Christopher Reeve is? Yep. He said that uh, he said that a hero, in his opinion, is somebody who 
continues to fight on in, in spite of overwhelming odds. Okay. He played Superman and he got paralyzed in the, yeah, after the riding accident. That, that's a good that's yeah. a good hero. So, um, Superman, Superman Lois Lane. So we had a gal in our group. She was suicidal. She said she had a gun in her house. I said, well, why don't you give it to a neighbor? She did. And she lived. And we did the gun with her. Um, yeah, that's me. Am I getting in the way of you? <laughs> what? No, no, I just, I'm, I don't know why. I just okay. to see the when top you, of you go to, Why don't we go to the next talk? Uh, <laughs> half the people who have attempted suicide report that the time before their first thought and attempt is 10 minutes. Thus, if they don't have the means to kill themselves during the 10 minutes, the impulse will pass. If in a moment of impulse a person cannot have access to firearms to arm themselves, they do not seek other means. This is so important. This is why... In America, life lifespan is going down for the first time. And the reason is because of all the men between 45 and 64 who are taking their lives because they have firearms in the house. Mm. And, and their their population is diminishing uh, because of the fact they had the, not only the thought of harming themselves, but the means. Wow. So the gun rights people are now getting together with mental health people to educate people about gun safety. The mental health people say, okay, we're not going to get the guns out of the house, but let's at least find a way to put them somewhere where a child can't find it or you know, or have a lock on it or something that makes access to the guns more difficult. If they're going to be around, let's at least make them more difficult. Right. So, at least make it where you have to think as you're right. getting right. to it. Right. Yeah. In a moment of impulse, a person can have access to a firearm to harm themselves if they do not seek them. So that's so yeah, it's, it's sort of like the, the people who don't jump off the Golden Gate Bridge because you stop them, and then you know 95% of them are still alive years later. So in that moment, if, if in that impulsive moment, if you can keep a person separate from the thing that could harm them, you know, then you've saved a life. So means are restricted. So I guess for you guys, means if the person seems like they're really suicidal, you could say, well, in the house, there are pills. Maybe you want to give your pills to someone else. Is there a rope? You know, is there a the knives, sharp objects, or is a gun? Ask them. I gave all my medication to my wife, Joan, three years ago because I knew in a moment of weakness I would take it. In fact, in the episode I write about in this book, I did try to take it. I had it all planned out, but my best friend's too. just happened to walk into my house at that moment. It interrupted me accidentally. Wow. So, so that was Thanks, very fortunate. Stuart. But yeah. <laughs> so that, that seems, that's really important about means restriction. Okay. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, so placing barriers on bridges or high buildings is a type of means restriction. The Vista Bridge is a local example of this. Has anyone ever been on the Vista Bridge? I never have. It's in downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. Portland's number one place for suicide. Mm -hmm. you know that? one's the Vista really? Bridge? Yeah. Is, the, is that the one with the walking path on it? I don't know. It, it's no, something. It's, it, it's, goes it's, burn, it's, it's, it goes over street. Yeah, it goes over street. And they would. Right, and but but it's in northwest it's it's in northwest Portland. Mm -hmm. It goes up to the west. It's called the Vista Bridge. Yeah, the suicide bridge. Yeah, the suicide bridge. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they finally got a, I think I think they finally got a barrier. Oh really? Yeah. After huh. all, the mental health people made a big stink. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Golden Gate Bridge is the world's leading suicide location. For years, the San Francisco community missed creating a barrier. Finally, they agreed to erect a barrier due to the to open in 2021. So I'm going to continue going with the slides. If we have the time, we can go back to this one. It's a five-minute video about all the work it took to convince the people of San Francisco that, you know, one life was worth, you know, having a little bit of a, a net that might cause the Golden Bridge not to be quite as beautiful. You wouldn't believe how much work it took. Again, the stigma about suicide mental health. I guarantee you, if, if putting up a net helped reduce the cancer rate 20%, they would have done it like that. Asking the person point. if it has a plan. If and when you ask this question, it depends on the information from the caller. You're looking for a plan, intent, and means. So intention and means. Without the means, there can be nothing happening. A person might say they have a plan, but we'll do it in a month from now or they're not sure when they might do it. But yeah, I always used to plan my suicide ahead of time. 
I felt great comfort knowing I could do it, but it was always something I was, you know, waiting to do in the future. Um, so has anyone ever asked that? In the caller? You please just said you have a plan yet. You know what you might do? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yes, what, what was yeah. your response? Um, well, so, so what was your question again? Have you ever asked the person on the, on, on the line if they had, you know... Oh, you yeah, and she shared her fantasy. She had a rope, but she wanted to hang from a tree. Right. So did you then ask, are you planning on doing this thing? Or is it just a fantasy some, that, that, that made you feel better? Well, we, we talked about it, and uh, we, we had a really great connection. And she said that, you know, she would put it off until she talked to me the next day or talked yeah, to me on Thursday. Yeah, there you got it right there. Don't do it today. Wait, wait another day. Because mm -hmm. the next thing you feel very different. I'm not saying don't kill yourself, but just don't kill yourself. Don't make an attempt for the next 24 hours. Wait till you talk to your counselor. Wait till you talk to your, your spouse. Or your just buy time. The two most important words. Buy time. Uh, yeah, buy time. Yeah, so if a person is in imminent danger, you may need to call a crisis line or a suicide prevention line or 911. So, yeah, when, when do you call the National Suicide Prevention Helpline? That's sort of a call you, a decision you have to make in the moment, right? Has anyone ever had people do that? Have you ever done a conference call? I or are you the helpline? So you, we try to get permission before we, we would even initiate it. Right. We, sure. we would certainly support somebody to make a call to a crisis service or another line if that's what they wanted to do, but it actually gets complicated because of the way our phone system is structured like they would actually need to use their cell phones to do a three-way call. So it's it's yeah. complicated. So maybe you could say this. If when you mm -hmm. get off this phone, aren't you only open from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m.? That's right. I have a good memory. Damn. Good. My father had it, so I'm paranoid. Um, so, um, um, so you're not always available. No. Nope. So what if it's 12 a.m. and the person's really feeling like they're not safe? Then to have the 24-hour line would be a nice resource. Absolutely. So do you ever at least let mm -hmm. them know, give the number to them, and then they say, use this if you can't get a hold of us? That makes sense, right? Yeah. So um, have you done that? Have you given people like the, the mm -hmm. local, tell them, call your local crisis line or call them? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, um Has anyone ever had a caller that said, I'm about to shoot myself now? I'm, I'm here. I'm calling you from the edge of a, a you know, a bridge. I'm about to jump. Oh, you're, you're fortunate. Uh, if that did happen, you'd have to think on your feet, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You'd probably say, well, can we talk a little bit? Stall them. And see if you can talk them down, like you said. If not, you could say, we'll get would you be willing to talk to a, a counselor? It would be nice if someone came out there and talked with you. Would that help? Anything to, you know, to keep them safe? That would, I suppose, be a time that you would suggest that something like a project respond yeah. would be a would be an option yeah, we'll to get, offer. Yeah, we'll get to that in the next okay. slide. Okay, what if you don't succeed? Has anyone ever asked, asked oh, that question? Sorry. In this book, The Suicide, The Forever Decision, that's what the guy says. It's more difficult than you think. He said He, he said in, in the actual book, human beings are hard to kill. Mm -hmm. Then he had all this list of gory details, which I don't want to read you about. A person who tried to jump off the bridge in the water and said rope and paralyzed from the you know, neck down. When I was uh, in, in 1983, when I was at my wit's ends and I went to the counselor and said, I, I know where I can get a gun. I'm just going to put the gun here and shoot. And he said, oh, I wouldn't do that because one of my clients did that just the other day. And he shot himself. He didn't die. He just became a vegetable. <laughs> and I, he scared the crap out of me, so I never did it. So... Um, so there are these stories about people failed attempts causing people disability in this video. So, so that was a strategy he used with me. 
that made me think twice. Has anyone ever yeah. thought about using that strategy? Yeah, they, they have all these examples in this book. A woman slid her list a long way and then she couldn't play the piano, which was her pride and joy. Another person, uh, you know, uh, tried hanging himself. It didn't work, but he had a, no oxygen coming to his brain, so he had brain damage. You know, all these people who lived, but lived, you think you're in hell now? <laughs> and it, that put enough doubt in my mind when that guy told me that. I thought, I thought you have to die if you shot Oh, not necessarily. <laughs> that was something like that you don't forget. So, so I thought that was just a, some isolated incident. And then, you know, in this in this classic book, you know, Suicide: The Forever Decision, he, he has a whole chapter, a whole chapter called "What If You Don't Succeed." He, and he, he was a suicide counselor for like forty years. He had all these stories about. Uh, yeah, when Tom, a teenage boy, put a 22 pistol in his head, pulled the trigger, pulled it under his temple, ripple through his brain, ricocheted around the inside of his skull and lodged in his jaw. He did not die, but now severely brain damaged. He lives on, unable to work or go to school. Anyway, he's, all these stories, after you, after you read this, a couple of these, you think. So, yeah, well, that's that's a strategy. And evidently, people who know what they're doing use it. So, I thought I'd just... I asked Sharon if I could put that in at the last minute. <laughs> We were talking about uh, bar you know what barriers are there right. when, you're, barrier. when you're live with a person you're you're actively exploring mm -hmm. trying to identify create barriers a yeah. barrier barrier would be what if it doesn't work um, so um, there's something called Project Respond it's for people mental health mental mechanic it's run by Cascadia anyone ever heard of Cascadia mm -hmm. of course. Even in crisis, the individual remains the expert on what is likely to benefit them. Now, this doesn't sound like a peer support idea. Planning for safety is a collaborative process between the individual and clinician. Project Response strives to provide the least restrictive option for creating a safety plan. This is directly from their website. It's cool. Mm -hmm. So this is just where you could actually have mental health workers and a peer support specialist going to the person's door and, and chatting with them in person. That didn't exist 20 years ago. All you'd have is the police. They don't know what they're doing most of the time. Right. So, so I found this resource. It's in Multnomah County. Every county is mandated by law to have their own mobile crisis response team. And so I thought I would just let you know that this thing exists for people in Multnomah County, but the Washington County Mental Health and Clackamas County have their own mobile response crisis team. So the whole idea is have people who are trained, you know, in peer support or counseling to go out and talk with a person as opposed to, you know, a law enforcement person and ha help them plan ways that they can, you know, take care of themselves. So, And then there's follow-up. Um, see, next, here, why don't you go on to the next slide. Once you refer for services, project response, private relations will speak directly to the fair and to gather information provide on-site risk assessment and safety planning, follow up services to support the person in recovery after the crisis. So if they come out and visit someone who's suicidal, then they'll call them in a couple of days, how's it doing? Then you go to this, you know, you go to this counselor that we referred you to or to your own counselor. So they don't just come out once and leave, they go ahead and they stick to the person. It's like when doctors make house calls, right? Mm -hmm. So your therapist is making a house call. Um, Okay, next slide. What if the person is imminent danger to self or others? The response team will suggest the person can go to the ER room and will help arrange for transportation. If the person resists it, succession, the mobile team may call 911. This is the option of the last resort. So, what if there's a person who doesn't want to go to the ER room but is clearly unsafe? Then um, they may have to be taken, you know, against their will. But I've never encountered this because all the people I work with are willing to get help. But I'm supposed this, this could happen. Has that ever happened here? Well, a person can say no nowadays, and the uh, responding team, because the mental health civil rights, has to say okay. They're they're not. They don't have the free. So um, you're saying that people can not call them free protocol, you know, to pull someone in 
if, if the person's saying, no, I don't want to go in. Yeah. Are you serious? Tom? Yeah, no, oh, that happens a lot. If yeah. you say you're going to hurt yourself or someone else, they have to. Take They're going to take you in if they think yeah. that you're in crisis. I mean... I think that's I'm, I'm just saying if they're, I'm just saying if they think you're uh, a danger to yourself and others, and and they would like to suggest that you go in and you say, then yeah. they they have to not take you in because of their rights. I mean, they asked you a question, but I my uh, my understanding of that is that they do an assessment for the seriousness of your ability to care for yourself or your possibility of danger to self or others. I, I mean, I don't I, I could be mistaken, but I'm not thinking if if I were seriously in crisis and they assess me at being in a state where I might be a danger to myself or others. I don't think saying no is going to stop it. Uh, I, I think. My hospital yeah. this class a couple months ago because she would say she was uh, wanting, you know, suicide or feeling suicide or feeling like it, she could hurt somebody else. And so they took her back to the waiting room and then she changed her mind and they let her go. Because she started wanting a cigarette. And they, it's actually harder now to get somebody to go to the hospital, you know, to get uh, in the hospital. I think there's a there's a, a a pretty large number of our callers who, if they are feeling like they're in crisis, are hesitant to um, to want to get. They definitely don't want police, and they don't want to be forced. So we're always sort of looking to connect with them and help them make a good choice for themselves. Um, which, you know, I mean, it's I think that that I think that this the the suggestion of Project Respond is that the the person is like imminently like the person is there with a gun and really serious about using it. I mean that that situation is really a tough call situation. Mm -hmm. But even with them, like we would want them to say yes, um, I'm willing to work with Project Respond, right, right. and I then guess, we could yeah. assist them. I guess do that. Then that's fine because so, Project Respond is there to help the person out if they want. And sometimes yeah. people feel it may be beneficial to have a live person there holding my hand. I mean, most people, again, oh, yeah. most people don't want to die out of the pain. So if they're given an option for something that could help them reduce their pain or get support, in most cases I've found in 17 years of my work, people mm -hmm. will take it because they uh, they just want to get out of the pain. And so they're, they're looking for ways to avoid taking the action. They don't really want to. They just feel like there's no other option, like, like the guy jumping off the bridge, uh, and, and Waterloo Bridge. And the, but, but then when the man said, uh, hey, um, it'll get better, mate. It'll get better. It burst the bubble, and he, and he suddenly realized, oh, there was an option. So, people, yeah. When when you get to a depressed state, your mind plays tricks on you. It tells you you're a burden to others. It tells you things will never get better. It it tells you uh, it tells you you know untruths because of the way that your 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 biochemistry is so you know dysregulated. But the fact is. That this is not true. Things can get better. I mean, you're not a burden to others, and so uh, in those extreme states, if, if, if you know, if so, there are other people, it takes another person to come in and burst through that bubble and, and, and get the person to see options that they can't see when they're in, they're in a yeah. state of misery. So that's the whole point. I was just so, referring to uh, mental health, civil rights, right, right, and right. that the response team can't speculate wildly. You know that someone is, in fact, a danger to themselves or others, unless I guess it's well, really obvious. And then, then probably the counselor or the officer and the peer support specialist so, can say, "This looks like they need to get to a safer place." So, um, yeah. what I encourage you guys to do is to do your own research. Like, I'll give call Project Respond and say, "Hey, we're on the warm line. When do you think you might be helpful to us?" You know, if we want you to. If the person wants you there, how do we get you out of here? You have to go through the mall and the cat and press line. I already, I already figured that out. Yeah. You've got a call. So just say, this is from Cascadia. This is from the perspective of the peer support. So, you know, get to know these people, and they may, in a pinch, be really helpful. And, and whatever other county these things are in. Well, it's all over the state, and in some counties, yeah. Right. The services are much less than right, that right. kind of a team. 
Yeah. yeah. Increase so, our resource list, though, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, why don't you go to lie to 63? Okay. Right there, where there's life, there's hope. When people prevented from dying by suicide, they get a new lease on life. Like that guy was jumped off from Niagara Falls. The study of 515 people who were prevented from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, 90% did not die by suicide. Where there's life, there's always hope. Remember what goes down must come up. People do emerge from the darkness into another typo and <laughs> into the light. But, uh, I cannot tell you how many times I have seen people, myself included, come out of situations that they, th they thought were impossible to come out of, and people come out of them. There is nothing fatal about depression or mental health issues or mental illness. It cannot kill you like cancer can, like leukemia can. It cannot physically kill you. So if you can just find a way to endure, they call it in the Bible, long-suffering. There's always a way out. The only person where that wasn't the case with this guy, Reed, where he simply was not able to endure. So how do you get people to endure? The way is through support. Mm -hmm. If he had just made that call to the Oregon War Miner that night, he would still be here. So it's, it's, it's always, you know, People always need to be encouraged to reach out. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And that with the help of others, this too shall pass. So there's a final slide there. Tomorrow's in the day. And there you have it. And I have an nice. appointment at 415 in Northwest Portland, but oh, I, can be, I can be a little late. <laughs> uh, but um, you're going to be like it or not. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I don't have, it's just my physical therapist. She has four, I just have to ask her a quick question about a shoe. <laughs> but... Uh, Thank you. So, Thank so what? You. So, what is the takeaway? The okay. takeaway is essentially that people become suicidal when they, they're in pain. Suicide is a strategy to escape the pain. The thing to do is to find a, a, a strategy that, if, if it doesn't help them escape the pain, at least helps them to endure the pain until, as Matt Hague said, the, cur the hurricane blows on through and it's mm -hmm. right. We've all gone through crises, right? Mm -hmm. And we've all emerged from them. And that's just the way it is. People with cancer, they get treatment and, you know, some of them survive. And so um, there's no reason why a person every 12 minutes has to die of a suicide in the United States. I, I, I think that it's preventable if people can be connected to resources both internally and externally. And I think a telephone crisis line or a telephone helpline is incredibly useful, low cost, low tech, and amazing. Every single breakdown I've had, I've used the crisis line in the city I was living in. So I'm both a consumer of it and someone who is, you know, people call me in the middle of the night sometimes. I'm just always to say, can you hang on another day, another hour, another minute? Can you just hang on another breath? Mm. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Thank anyway, you. I'm going to make all the okay. grammatical corrections about the slideshow, and I'll send Karen some links about the, all these things I mentioned. Before we're. Oh, by the before way, this we is close okay. down, I just wanted to make space for uh, folks on the on the meeting here with us. Did people have any comments or questions before we stop? Hey, if not, we just really thank you guys for listening in. This is going to be a recording that we can share with people also. Also, um, don't forget to put two additional hours on today's date for the training that you just um, that we just had. Two hours. Thank you. We value your time. We appreciate you going through this. I look forward to having more time to discuss it with you guys. Okay, take care. I need to quickly use the bathroom. There's one here and one in the kitchen.